Court when I, along with others, conceived of this project, I don't think we knew what we were getting into. But it has truly proven to be a fascinating <coughs> endeavor in studying a true asset of our community. Benjamin Godfrey came to the area in 1832. He came with his wife and eight children, a seafaring captain, a slaver. He came to make a name in a 30-year period, 30 to 35 years. He, he was a man of religion in that he founded three churches, or was instrumental in the founding of three, three churches. The first being St. Paul's in Alton, the second being the Godfrey Chapel, and the third being the Congregational Church, also in Godfrey. He founded Monticello Seminary, female seminary, a woman's school. <coughs> He founded and financed a railroad extending from Alton to Springfield. He owned over 10,000 acres of land in Madison County. He went bankrupt. He was also a millionaire. But ever was he a gentleman in whatever endeavors that he pursued. His life was one of vision. It was one of entrepreneurship. <coughs> and I think he felt probably like George Lucas felt. I'm not sure that I'm going to reach the end, but I know that what I do will be done in earnest and to the benefit of mankind. And all of those endeavors are what we, as a committee of 20, who have been working on this for about two years, have set to four of recognizing his vision and his entrepreneurship. There are eight sites in which he was involved. The brochure <coughs> that you have identifies those eight sites. They will be identified by signage and then an iPhone app, which you can listen to if you go to the site. <clears throat> we have secondarily written a book, which is shown up here at the rostrum, and that's called Seymour Bluffs and Benjamin Godfrey. <clears throat> this is Benjamin Godfrey's life in a third and fourth grade version. <clears throat> that will be utilized in the curriculum for the Alton schools starting in September. <coughs> the tourism aspect simply ties <coughs> into already that which we have, uh, the landmarks of uh, great notoriety and of great interest. Remember, Godfrey was a friend and an associate of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln helped him with the railroad. He was a friend of Lovejoy in that he and Winthrop Gilman rented to Lovejoy at the warehouse down on the riverfront, and that's where Lovejoy was <coughs> The last aspect of which we are planning to do is to provide two scholarships for worthy students, much akin to what Rotary does in honoring students. And we will look to students with vision, <coughs> entrepreneurship, and a desire to come back to the area to live and to work. Another item or another platform that we're pursuing is a videography. We have uh, videoed all of the activities that have gone into the project to date. So the video will incorporate those aspects of the project 
as well as tell Benjamin's history. That will be used for sales purposes and hopefully a sales tool. Last October, we had a public opening out at Lewis and Clark College. That evening, we presented Benjamin Godfrey and Friends. Benjamin is here today, having made the trip from his home by carriage this morning, leaving there at 7 o'clock, and arriving here about five hours later. Now his desire is to stay here and get cool, so the more questions that you might have of him after his <coughs> presentation, the better he will like it. His horse is inside, in the back of the building, also cooling off. With those introductory remarks, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the rostrum and to introduce to you Benjamin Godfrey. Thank you very much for those words of, of wisdom, or historical words. I am not going to use the rostrum, I'm going to kind of wander around a little bit. Uh, even in the hottest summer's days, uh, myself would always uh, have a hat similar to this, and people would, they knew me as Captain Godfrey, so whenever they called out my name, I always, as a courtesy to them, would tip my hat and, and greet them in the streets or wherever I might be. Now today, in my days traveling, today I, I, I have a very fine uh, automobile, uh, caddy black, black, but back in my day I drove around in a, uh, or rode around in a very fine horse. Um, the finest horses were always uh, the prized possessions of wealthier people in the communities where they lived. Now I was born in 1797 in, uh, near Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And if you've ever been out to Cape Cod, it's the most beautiful place. And a lot of the things that I brought to this part of the country <coughs> mirrored those things that I left as from my boyhood home. And as the seagull would fly out to sea and back, a lot of the young boys, uh, myself being one, we went out to sea with our fathers. Sometimes they were fishermen, sometimes they were actual captains that went out uh, across the ocean to Europe. My, my father died when I was nine years old, <coughs> and my mother remarried. And my stepfather took me out to sea to learn the ways of being a sea captain. That's the way the young men learned their trade. There were not too many formal schools, but my father taught me well. I lived in Ireland for a while, and I, I transported product from Europe to then uh, uh, the United States of America. Uh, the War of 1812, I was oh, about 18 years old, but believe yeah, I was uh, enlisted in the uh, Navy. So I, I am a veteran of the United States Armed Forces of the War of 1812. I didn't see much action. We just kind of were in a small frigate that kind of guarded up and down the coastal areas, watching over the cities of New York and, and Boston and Philadelphia. Uh, in 1821, um, I married for the first time. Harriet was my first wife. She was a very, very sweet thing. I was 23. She was 16 years old. That was not uncommon for young girls to marry young, and she bore for me uh, eight children. Um, uh, she was a very, very good woman. Um, and uh, I was able to make quite a bit of money and profit, but I wasn't home very often. But of course, I had children with her, so I was home enough for that. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I traveled back and forth between Europe quite a bit and around from New York and Philadelphia and Boston down to New Orleans and over to Mexico and, and uh, uh, 1832 in New Orleans I met a fine young man, he was about 20 years my uh, junior, Winthrop Gilman was his name, and he was also a man who was a captain as such, and he moved product up and down the great Mississippi River, and he told me about this city, uh, a new city, a jewel of the west in the state of Illinois, a new state, 1818, state of Illinois called Alton, Illinois. So he and I uh, got along quite well, <clears throat> and we became partners. And uh, I came to Alton in 1832 with $50,000 in cash, which is uh, a sizable amount of money for those years. And I wanted to amend my ways. I wanted to change my life a bit, you know. Uh, I had some uh, baggage, as it's termed uh, today, baggage. Uh, I will speak briefly of it, but. 
part of my transportation of product uh, back and forth across the ocean and product from New York and Boston down in New Orleans. Uh, I was moving human cargo slaves. Uh, I'm not proud of that fact. You remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the northern people had slaves too. President George Washington had slaves living in the presidential house in Philadelphia. And by the 1820s, 1830s, slaves became of little value to the north. Uh, they were being replaced by uh, paid staff members. But there was value to those slaves down in New Orleans. <coughs> So they were herded together, literally. It was a very, I don't like speaking of it because my heart hurts for those people. We moved them from Boston and Philadelphia, New York, down to New Orleans, and where they were sold back into slavery. So when I came to Alton, that was in my past. Often people ask me, well, Captain Duffy, what did you do? What did you do? And I said, well, I was a sea captain. That's why they called me captain. But I, I really did not want to tell too much about my past, especially about the moving of slaves. So I came here to Alton with $50,000, and I wanted to change my ways. As soon as I stepped off that boat, I saw a need for a large church building to be built. So in 1832, I built uh, what is now St. Paul's Episcopal Church. That church building is still there. And even though they say it was raised, it was not raised. It was, it was twink, I guess the word is today. But that church still stands as a legacy to my, my, my legacy, I guess. I used that, that church was used as a meeting hall. I let the fine Baptists use it. I let, I let the fine Presbyterians use it, but never the Catholics. And then uh, the uh, Episcopalian Church of St. Paul approached me in 1847, and I, they offered to buy that piece of property, and I, I sold that uh, church to them. And still to this day, that congregation still prays in that building that I built way back in 1832. Across the street, which is now, I believe it's called the... Bradford. There were um, Winthrop Gilman and I built two fine townhomes. These were three-story homes, and they were very, very grand for their day. Uh, there is an old lithograph of uh, Alton. You can see them standing across the street from the uh, St. Paul's Church. Um, I lived there for a bit of a time, but coming from New Orleans, when people lived together as a group, of groups of people, sanitation was practically nothing. And a lot of sickness uh, would happen in residential where a lot of people came together. They were not taking care of their, their sanitation needs properly. So in 1834, I bought a two-room uh, stone house out near a place called Scarrett's Prairie, Monticello, near now what stands Walmart. <laughs> and I added that onto that house and made it into 14 rooms, <coughs> seven fireplaces. We had indoor plumbing, but primitive as it was. And I moved my children out there to get away from the smells and the bad sanitation of the vault. <clears throat> Traveling back in those days is very, very rough, as comments were made about me leaving my home early this morning to get here on time. Uh, the roads were basically almost non-existent. Um, if you had a single run, that was for a single horse to go down. Abraham Lake and my good friend, personal attorney, stayed with me at my house many times. Would, the horse would travel down that single path. If you had two paths, it was like equivalent to a modern highway. So I did build, and when it rained or snowed, my goodness, you couldn't find the road. It was snowed and it was mud, so I built a fine wooden road from uh, Scarrett's Prairie into Alton, and it was a toll road. It was a very, very successful operation. For some strange reason, whatever I touched became a success. I was known as a very successful businessman and millionaire at the time even though I lost my fortune uh, many times. So the people would come in and out of town on, the, uh, on this, uh, this wooden road, a toll road, and down into Alton. Now, in 1838, it was a great year for me uh, personally, uh, uh, and uh, tragically for me as well. I had um, eight daughters. And schooling back in these days was very, very, very limited, even for the people of means. This was a lot of times before public schools had started, you know. And the girls were often not educated at all. But my thinking was, if you educate a man, you educate a single individual. <clears throat> but if you educate a woman, if she marries and has children, there's a chance for that, that woman to become a teacher for that whole group, that whole family. So I was a strong supporter of uh, a good education. I built a substantial building out there, uh, which is now Lewis and Clark College. That original building stood until the 1880s. It burned down, and the present large stone structure there was built forward of it. And they used a lot of the stones from the old structure 
to, to rebuild it. And um, I opened that school. I had the finest educators from Princeton uh, University and Yale come out. Uh, a lot of them had strong religious backgrounds, Bible people, Presbyterians. And we started a very fine school there. And for years, it was a premier school in the area and was quite the building to be built and seen by public. A lot of people would come out. And when we had our graduations, it was a big event where the girls would have, they'd have to stand up and speak their parts in front of a whole group of people as part of his graduation. Um, back in 1837, uh, uh, Elijah Lovejoy, uh, uh, going back a year, 1837, uh, he came to Alton with baggage. I thought I had baggage. He had a lot more baggage. <laughs> he was quite a character. Probably, I will say this, uh, he was an interesting character. Most people really didn't like his ways. He was a very, 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 very opinionated. And uh, he was an abolitionist. Now, I was against slavery. That was totally different being anti-slavery as being an abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln would be considered anti-slavery. I was anti-slavery. Winthrop Gilman, my business partner, was anti-slavery. But uh, Elijah Lovejoy was an abolitionist, a radical, much more radical against slavery. And we leased him. Uh, one of our uh, second floor spaces, uh, one of our finest warehouses, and that warehouse stood, if you were familiar with Alton, behind State Street is a street called William. Take William Street down to what is now Broadway, it was Second Street back then. Between today, those giant silos was where that warehouse stood. And from uh, my townhouse on that November night, November 7th, 1837, uh, I could see that there were some bad activities going down there because Alton at the time was uh, settled by some educated, Bible-fearing, non-drinking people from the East. And there were some rough folk from like Tennessee and Kentucky that drank and didn't go to church too much. They were very much pro-slavery. I did not go down that evening. Uh, I saw the problems. I saw the flares and so on. Winthrop went down there and that night uh, a mob tried to uh, destroy that printing press. And they did. And then, uh, process they also killed Elijah Lovejoy. His brother Owen was there. If you ever Google Elijah Lovejoy, you get pictures of his brother Owen. There are no pictures. There are no pictures of me, Benjamin Godfrey, or of Elijah Lovejoy. So um, that school, they met in that school, I think that was one of my biggest things. I really it was one of my my crowning achievements. I financed it, I backed it, I pushed as much money as I could into it, but finally turned it over to a board and they, 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 uh, they continued on to that school, and that school continued to be in operation until 1970 when the campus was bought by the state of Illinois. And today I'm very proud to say that even in my advanced age, I can go by and see all those beautiful buildings there. That chapel there, that beautiful chapel, was built to mirror that which I left out east in Massachusetts. Winthrop, got, uh, Winthrop uh, uh, Gilman, his home is the house that has the white columns on the front of it. That was his personal home. His home was there. Mine was farther down the road. Now, one of the things that uh, one of my great uh, money-making uh, propositions was with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we um, worked with the state of Illinois, and we began the construction of one of the first, if not the first, railroads in the state of Illinois. And we began construction down by where the Alton Bell is today in 1847. And by 1852, we had laid track up, 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 up to the flat prairie and all the way to Springfield, became an Alton Sagamon Railroad Company, eventually connected to Chicago. I did not have enough money to get that project started, but I started a bank, and whenever I started anything, That's and people could get a chance to quote join with me, they did, because I was a very successful fellow. So my money was put in, the bank was very prosperous, and the railroad was a great success, and the rest is history. Abraham Lincoln, his wife, and their oldest son, Robert, came down that railroad from Springfield, the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858. So looking back, my life was very, very interesting. Honestly, most people back in these years, folks, did not live to be a very old person like I. I died in 1862. I was, what, 60, 67 years old. Many people died before that. Many people did not move away more than five miles at the most from where they were born. And here I was in Europe, and I was in Boston, and New York, and Philadelphia, and Mexico. And my experience was wide and varied. And when I came to Alton, I brought a lot of that which I was here and tried to do the best I could to make Alton a great community. Now, <clears throat> my house, 
uh, in uh, out in Gantry, remained in the family until 1895, when my second wife, I married a second time, we had children as well. She lived in the house till 1895, and then it passed on to uh, uh, another name. There are many, many uh, descendants of uh, Benjamin Godfrey. Some are in the area. Most have flown away, like the seagull, seagulls at, in, at Cape Cod. But there are still members of the uh, Benjamin Godfrey family in the area. Um, so now I'm going to switch over a bit to me, John Meehan. Uh, I lived in I've lived in Alton since 1990, and uh, when you start researching a person like Benjamin Godfrey or Elijah Lovejoy, especially Benjamin Godfrey, he was quite the person, ladies and gentlemen. He really was. He really made a big difference to the communities of uh, uh, Alton and to Monticello, which was what it was called back then. Uh, I am buried out at the Monticello at the Godfrey Cemetery. Go to a place called Josephine's. Josephine's over here, there's a school back, I think it's Mulberry Street. Mm -hmm. It kind of dead ends back there, and my grave is marked back there. So um, this legacy trail is something that is a vision, okay? A vision of some business people and a lot of citizens, including myself, uh, a, a vision to make the memory of God to come alive to people in a, a, in a way that is valuable in 2017. But even back in Benjamin Godfrey's day, any, any project worked uh, or had merit, it had to have vision, but it also had to have financial backing. Money, 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 money still talks to this day in 2017. So we are actively seeking organizations and groups like their own here to contribute to the cause here. Um, it is a worthy cause. Uh, we're, we're doing well. We've had some good contributions, and I'm taking this role uh, on as a citizen of Alton. I've contributed, um, and it's really a, a, a he was a great fellow. And really, Alton would not be what it is today if it wasn't for uh, uh, like the person of uh, Captain Godfrey. 